On behalf of the Murphy Institute for Catholic, Social, Catholic Thought, Law, and Public Policy, it's a great pleasure to welcome you this evening to a lecture by Bishop Charles Morrow. Bishop Morrow is the Bishop of uh, Lausanne, Geneva, and Fribourg, Switzerland. He uh, entered the Dominican novitiate in 1983, was ordained a priest in 1988, and earned a licentiate in theology from the University of Fribourg in 1987. He later earned a doctorate in theology from the University of Fribourg. In 1996, he earned a licentiate in philosophy, and in 2004, earned a doctorate in theology from the Catholic University of Toulouse in France. He has taught at the University of Fribourg, uh, and from 1996 to 2011, at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome, the Angelicum, uh, with which we have an affiliated program, the Catholic Studies Angelicum program in Rome. Uh, from 2008 to 2011, he served as the director of our program there, and of course, we are very grateful for that work that he did on our behalf. In April of 2009, he was appointed Secretary General of the International Theological Commission, and in that same year, a consultant of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. He is, uh, in 2009, in the same year, appointed the rector of the uh, Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas. He has been involved in a wide variety of ecumenical and theological issues, including the dialogue with the Anglican Communion, the Orthodox Churches, and the Society of St. Pius X. In 2011, he was named Bishop of Lausanne, Geneva, and Fribourg by the Holy Father, and we are very grateful uh, that he is with us again this evening. Tonight he will be speaking about the issue of religious liberty in the light of Dignitatis Humanae, the Vatican, Second Vatican Council's Declaration on Religious Freedom, a view from Europe. Please join me in welcoming uh, Bishop Charles Morrow. Thank you for these very good words. I must say that it is a joy to be here also because my connections with this university and the Catholic Studies program uh, has been something very pleasant and very good. It, very good, it, I can say that from my side. <laughs> well, you know that uh, Vatican II published in 1965 a document on religious freedom. I will speak a little bit about the document, but above all about what it can mean in Europe nowadays. When the day itself, when it was promulgated by Pope Paul VI, the same Pope Paul VI, although not during the promulgation, said, this is a declaration which will undoubtedly remain one of the greatest documents of this council. Historically speaking, it is a little bit early for us to know whether it, it is true, but I think it is. In the future, when people will speak about Vatican II, it will be, the, this declaration on religious liberty will be seen as one of the main documents. And I can say that perhaps above all from a European perspective, and I will try to say why. Well, the backgrounds of on the, about the question of religious liberty were quite different in Europe and in the United States. So in a sense, it was far from being an obvious step to publish a text on that in a council in Europe. It was not a difficult idea seen from an American perspective. Above all, if by American I mean the United States, because for that Latin America was much more similar to Europe for historical reasons also. Many people would say that Dignitatis Humanae was uh, an American document in Vatican II. And not only in the United States, people would say that also in Europe. And there is a reason for that. It is that in the United States, country founded, as you know better than I do, it, um, I hope at least, um, <laughs> Religious liberty was part of a founding idea of a country, namely people 
left Europe because of its lack, in part because of its lack of religious liberty, and found a place here that would grant religious freedom. In Europe, it was not the same, and this is precisely one of the reasons why people had to leave Europe. And the fact that it was not the same is something grave deep in European history and related to the religious wars after the Reformation. People did fight a lot in Europe after the Reformation because of a principle that was generally accepted before, namely the unity of society is due in a part to a religious unity and people should have the same religion. And that principle was generally accepted, simply not accepted with the same perspective. That means everybody should be Catholic or everybody should be Protestant the way we are Protestant. If the wars of religion at some time, at some point, more or less stopped, it is due to the fact that the idea that I mentioned was maintained, but for each single state, more or less. If you are in this country, you will have this religion. The next country might have another religion. That was not an idea of religious freedom, simply an idea of state church, more or less, more or less everywhere, but not the same one everywhere. On that basis, there was no real religious freedom. And that is not the case anymore. Nevertheless, we still see some signs of that. Because unlike the American situation, there are several European countries where a church, or more than one, has a um, privilege in a state. Let us take not Britain, but England or Scotland. There is an established church in England which is Anglican, another one in Scotland which is Presbyterian. But this is not the only example. For instance, in Greece, an orthodox country, Article 3 of the Constitution says, I quote part of it, the prevailing religion in Greece is that of the Eastern Orthodox Church of Christ. And it goes on explaining how it is related to Constantinople. The same Article 3 of the Greek Constitution, a little bit later, says something quite surprising, namely, I quote, the text of the Holy Scriptures shall be maintained unaltered. The official translation thereof into any other linguistic form without the sanction of the Autocephalous Church of Greece and the Great Church of Christ in Constantinople is prohibited. And this is Article 3 of the Constitution. That says something, I don't know how it, it works out, but at least it is in the Constitution. And in many countries where the links are a little bit less strict, the church receives a very significant help from the church. Um, uh, well, also the church from the state. Uh, this is mainly the point. In countries like, in different ways, Italy, Spain, Malta, Poland, Austria, Germany, most of Switzerland, and in most of Scandinavia, where it is not the Catholic church, even in France, where church and state were separated in 1905, and there is a very strong idea of the laicity of the state. Nevertheless, the church or the cities have to pay for maintenance and perhaps um, rebuilding sometimes of the Catholic churches and only Catholic built before 1905. And in a part of a country, which was not French in 1905, the bishops are still appointed by the president of a republic, which is, it seems, the only country in the world. So the situation, the, the historical background in terms of relationships between state and church is not the same in Europe and in the United States. Until Vatican II, and even at the beginning of the Council, or shortly before the Council, there were commissions that prepared the future texts of the Council, where the usual idea was still maintained, at least, uh, namely, where Catholics are a minority, we must ask for toleration. When we are the majority, we must not grant it. 
We can accept the presence of some others, but not too much. In 1962, that means the year before the Council, um, oh well, actually, the year, in the months before the Council started, in, at the beginning of 1962, for instance, Cardinal Leger, Archbishop of Montreal, said, well, our idea of the relationship between church and state is simply hateful, and many non-Catholics hate us because of that. Namely, give us something that we don't give you. By the way, it is what we say nowadays about some Muslim countries. But our official theory until 19, 1962 was not too different. And because of that, the Declaration on Religious Freedom was not an easy thing to get through in, at Vatican II, and not always an easy thing to have it accepted nowadays, even nowadays. There was a certain struggle in Vatican II itself about religious freedom and between some European and American theologians, namely, and I'm referring to an article published by a French church historian who teaches in Washington, D.C., and who therefore has an idea on, about both sides of the Atlantic, and who says, well, it is not true that the American Jesuit John Courtney Murray was the main author of Unitatis Humanae, because there was also the French Dominican Yves Congar, future cardinal, and they did actually fight. And what Congar says about Courtney Murray is not always very polite. He said, I think he's intellectually honest, but when I hear of him speak about things I know, I see that he's never accurate. So I suspect that he might not be about other topics either. <laughs> so it was not a completely friendly relationship. And uh, Courtney Murray said about the contributions of French theologians, well, they speak about ideal ideas. What truth is, what the church is, but they are not practical enough. And as Courtney Murray had uh, problems with his leg, I don't know whether it was broken, but at least um, it was not in, in a good shape. He spent some time in the hospital during which Conga managed to get an introduction to the Nitatis Humani written by him and get through uh, into the text. And he says, thanks to God, Courtney Murray was in the hospital in more or less these terms, perhaps I make his terms a little bit better. <laughs> but what is typical for a European perspective in, at the beginning of uh, the Declaration on Religious Freedom, it says at least something that mattered to Europeans and not to Americans, at least not in the same way. The Vatican Council searches into the sacred tradition and doctrine of the Church and continually brings forth new things that are in harmony with the things that are old. In the United States, that was not a problem. People lived happily with religious freedom and were happy to go on like that. In Europe, that was a change. And so they had to say, and it's not the only place in Vatican II, we are not really changing. We say something renewed on the basis of what was said before. That was more a European concern than an American one. But what is, after all, the impact of the Declaration on Religious Liberty in the Church and in the world? I think that one impact that one can mention and should mention and that I am about to mention <laughs> is that for centuries, the, and it, it is going on, the Enlightenment had criticized the Catholic Church and all religions based on the Revelation for being responsible for violence. And as you know, it is still a rather popular argument. I could mention the British biologist, Richard Dawkins, whom you know because he also comes to the United States from time to time, when he says, for instance, 
Oh, a TV show I had in England was advertised with a picture of Manhattan with the Twin Towers. And the title was Imagine a World Without Religion. And you see what it means. Without religion, the Twin Towers would still be there. And he says there are other examples because he doesn't want to accuse one religion only, the Crusades and all these things. Well, of course, we can't deny that religion sometimes plays a role in violence and has played such a role through the centuries. It seems to me that one of the important contributions of the Declaration on Religious Freedom is that we can, as Christians and as Catholics, give an answer to that coming from the teaching of the Church. Namely, well, I read part of a text of the Declaration on Religious Freedom in uh, chapter 9. This doctrine of freedom has roots in divine revelation. It's not the only thing they say. Before, the, the Declaration says, religious freedom is rooted in nature, in human nature, created by God, and in divine revelation. This is the point here. For this reason, Christians are bound to respect it all the more consciously, conscientiously. Revelation does not indeed affirm in so many words the right of men to immunity from external coercion in matters religious. It does, however, disclose the dignity of the human person in its full dimensions. It gives evidence of the respect which Christ showed towards the freedom with which man is to fulfill his duty of belief in the word of God and it gives us lessons in the spirit which disciples of such a master ought to adopt and continually follow. What does that mean? Basically, this, have, this text has a wide potential because it means look at the gospel, look at Jesus Christ, our master, our God. He doesn't oblige his disciples or people who are around him to believe what he says. If they want, good. And it shows to us that violence committed by Christians is not due to the fact that they are Christians, but is committed by them because they are not Christian enough. On this basis, Pope John Paul II could apologize for the acts of violence committed by members of a church. And so it is a strong point. We can criticize our own sins, our own violence, thanks to what we are, namely we are Christians. And it is a better way of criticizing it than not to be Christians. And then the text shows even the Christian roots of religious freedom. The gospel shows that Jesus does not oblige anybody to believe. And that changed society, slowly but really. People who want to fight for religious freedom nowadays should at least take into consideration that it also has, and it mainly has, I suppose, Christian roots. If we lose these Christian roots, we might also lose religious freedom. And there are reasons to say that. And the reasons to say that is, among the reasons to say that, there is a certain evolution of contemporary society and I'm going to speak about that from a European perspective. In the last 20 or more than 20 years, in the last 30 or 40 years, religion unexpectedly came back on the cultural scene. The, positive, but the positivistic idea was it will disappear into something of the past. Actually, no, it's coming back, but not always in a good way, because it attracts some attention, because it also brings with it some violence sometimes. It is not so much the case in Europe, because Europe is not a continent of deep religious violence, above all since the end of the troubles in Northern Ireland, or of a war in ex Yugoslavia, where there was a religious dimension, although not only, perhaps not mainly, but it was part of it. Europe is quite peaceful, but not completely. There are worrying facts that are became, becoming increasingly conscious in Europe. At the world level, statistics show, of course, 
we must study statistics to know what they really mean and how they have been prepared, that so-called harassment against religions is increasing. Harassment is a good word because it is not necessarily violent persecution. There are different ways of making people's life difficult. And in the world at large, it is becoming more difficult to have a religion, but that implies mainly, if you count the number of countries where there is such a problem, to Christians. And there is in Vienna, Austria, the so-called Observatory on Intolerance and Discrimination Against Christians in Europe that publishes every year a rather detailed report about really problems against Christians in Europe. So I will use some elements of it. And, uh, well, examples they give, and I choose my examples in order to avoid simply private acts. For instance, the fact that many people act against churches, try to burn them down or things like that, things a little bit less extreme usually, can be attributed to small groups of individuals, even though it can happen at many places. But there are more worrying facts, such as legal steps against Christians in different ways. And people are conscious of that. For instance, in 2009, in the United Kingdom, when people asked whether there would be more di negative discrimination against Christians than against others, 66% of people said yes. Christians are the ones who have most problems. 63% in 2009. In 2010, when the same question was asked in the United Kingdom, 74% said yes. So there is an increasing and rather serious consciousness of a problem. And there are um, reasons to say that. One is what happens in courts, one is what happens in the media, the TV, newspapers, and so on. And these things are especially interesting. It is not only the idea of some Christians who have a specific concern. In July 2011, <clears throat> not too long ago, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe adopted a resolution recommending that a public debate on intolerance and discrimination against Christians be initiated. <clears throat> In 2011, <laughs> the Church of England, that I mean Anglican, said that we should be explicit about the need to counter attempts to marginalize Christianity. The same year, 2011, the Russian Orthodox Patriarchate note, notes a profound concern of its synod that the increase of Christianophobia in the world. So, and they are not Catholics. It's not surprising, by the way, that they notice the same problem. There are examples of condemnation, condemnations by court. In Britain, the Christian owners of a guest house who restricted double rooms to married couples have been ordered to pay £3,600 in damages to a homosexual couple. In Germany, um, somebody who simply put went to front, front of a hospital and said, why does this doctor kill unborn children? That was simply put as a question. Um, also had to pay a fine. A French history teacher who spoke about abortion at, in class and commented on the legal system in France was permanently dismissed. Um, an English medical doctor who simply spoke about his faith to uh, somebody who was healed by him and who had accept, accepted to speak about faith was, <coughs> excuse me, uh, had, uh, was given a disciplinary call first time in his 30 years of career simply because he had spoken about his Christian faith. In 2011, a member of the British government 
called for a ban on marriages at Christian churches if they refused to also perform same-sex unions. The Swedish Parliament in 2011 voted to campaign against the Council of Europe resolution, which reiterated the right to conscientious objection for health professionals who do not want to perform abortions. So these are decisions by courts or statements by members of governments, and not only ideas of individuals. An example that I just quoted is the situation of medical doctors, students in medicine or pharmacists, who would like to object, for instance, to performing abortion, it is, or in the case of uh, pharmacists, to give pills that abort. Their right to conscientious objection is recognized by law everywhere in Europe, but in practice, it is very difficult for instance, to get a job, even on the basis of practical reasons, such as it is a small hospital, we only have three gynecologists, and we have to do everything, you know? And if we have one who doesn't want to perform abortions, when the others are on holidays, what is going to happen? So, of course, we respect your right, but here it is not possible. There would be, and it is quite common, arguments of that kind, more or less explicit, to make very difficult for Christians to practice at least some fields of medicine. Increasingly, if you want to be a gynecologist, you can do it. It's almost impossible. In some countries it is, and, but you would have to go to another country. It's very difficult in Switzerland. I know I have some friends who are gynecologists and who did fight for that. But it is also interesting, uh, looking at a survey in Scotland, where students in medicine were asked, do you think that your right for conscientious objection is not respected enough? The huge majority of Muslim students said, yes, it is not respected enough. The majority of Jews and Protestants also, but only 46% of Catholics. So I think that sometimes the conscious conscience of Catholics has not been prepared well enough to think about these things. Of course, it is one poll in Scotland. I wouldn't say that it is the same everywhere. Another question which is difficult is the public display of religious symbols. There are examples. Once again, it is not that I'm completely fixed about the United Kingdom, but there are, at least perhaps it is better known, in 2012, in the March of this year, uh, it's not the only case, but for instance, a former nurse and a former British Airways uh, stewardess went to the European Court of Human Rights to ask for their rights to be respected because they had been fired in England in their respective jobs for wearing a cross. Religious sign, you should not. It's offensive to part of the persons with whom you work. Another example, in 2012, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, which is an institution of the Council of Europe, which, by the way, is not the European Union. It is much bigger. It has twice more members than the European Union. In the Council of Europe, there are many states that are not members of the European Union, such as Switzerland, my country, or Russia, or the Ukraine, or Armenia, Ukraine, I'm not sure, Armenia, certainly, Turkey. And the European Court of Human Rights unanimously confirmed the condemnation by the Swedish tribunals of four persons who had distributed in a school some leaflets criticizing homosexuality. The arguments are interesting. One must grant that the arguments used on these leaflets were a little bit extreme. And so, perhaps if the arguments would have been a little bit different, it would not have been the same as the court actually said. And the court also said, you are giving them in a school, that means in a place where the children are subject to influence and are not able to say no. So these are part of the arguments of the European Court of Human Rights. <coughs> Something, uh, and the court also said, freedom of expression is important, but it should not clash with other rights. It is uh, rather 
important argument nowadays. Of course, you have a freedom to say what you believe, but that should not uh, have a bad impact on others. So how, what is the respective weight of the rights of the ones and the others? But it is interesting precisely that the same argument led the same European Court of Human Rights to an opposite result in another situation. Namely, the case of a um, Finnish woman from Finland living in, living in Italy and who had two children in Italian state schools. And in Italian state schools, there are crosses, crucifixes in the schools. And that Finnish woman went to courts in Italy saying that the crosses should be taken away because they were offensive to her children and had a bad impact on their education. All Italian courts, one after the other, is different levels, refused what she was asking for. So she went to the European Court of Human Rights. In order to go there, you must have tried everything in your own country, in your own country, in all cases. And in 2009, the European Court of Human Rights approved that woman's argument and said that therefore Italy had to take away crosses from public schools and to change its laws. But Italy had recourse against that to the Grand Chamber of the same European Court of Human Rights. And in between, a lot of things happen. Namely, for instance, 22 countries, members of the Council of Europe, criticized the previous judgment and said the court should not issue such a judgment and gave arguments for that. Namely, it is not the task of a court to forget the principle of subsidiarity and to change the, the laws of the member states if there is no very good reason to do so. Or, for instance, the court should take into consideration that um, even a secular view of society is something that has an impact on the education and should not criticize only religious views, but also other views that are not always more open to religious freedom, such a secular idea of a state. Or if there are 30 children in a school, how can the court say that the mother of one of the children has more rights to express her religious freedom and her view of education than the parents of the 29 others. And the result of these arguments expressed by states, including states that went to the court when the Grand Chamber issued its judgment, and interestingly enough, the courts that went to the states that sent their ambassadors to the court were almost all Orthodox countries, Greece or countries from Eastern Europe. And a small delegation of um, Western European countries, namely the Principality of Monaco and the Republic of San Marino, which means not two very big states. <laughs> but of course, Italy asked for that and was also supported by other countries. Simply, they didn't go to court. But in 2012, that means this year, the Grand Chamber of a court, uh, Europe, European Court of Human Rights reversed the previous judgment and said, actually, Italy has a right to keep crosses in classes. And we say that also because the fact that there are crosses in Italian classes doesn't mean that there is no right to say something else in classes. And we know that in Italian state schools where Catholic education is given, st the students have a right to receive educations in other religions if they are there. So that was also an argument. <clears throat> which is interesting. And of course, when the European, the Grand Chamber decided that, it was decided by 15 judges against two, and the two judges, the two dissenting judges, gave arguments to explain why they had voted no, and said, well, the laws that say that there should be crosses in Italian schools are either a law which was introduced before Italy was united, namely in 1860, 
or laws issued by the fascist government in 1922 and 1924 and 28. And therefore, they are not very democratic laws. That was not enough as an argument, because the court looked at the content and said, it is at least what has been explained by one of the 15 judges who said, well, we, it is not up to the court to bankrupt centuries of European tradition. We should not forget that for centuries, education has been in the hands of the church, and it worked well out. It is one of the reasons why there is contemporary Europe as we know it, and perhaps we should not simply get rid of that. And then he also said, uh, well, the parents of the other children also have the right to say something. So, in a sense, these judgments show a different number of things. Namely, there is a certain pressure also by a court against religious freedom, but there is at the same time a consciousness in courts of a necessity to defend religious freedom. So, it is not a very clear situation. And the permanent representative of the Holy See to the Council of Europe in Strasbourg explained last week in Rome where uh, Bishop Pichet and myself attended a uh, school for new bishops, but that was in the European group, and we were in two different groups at the end. He explained to us um, what had played a role in the changing attitude of the Europe European Court of uh, Human Rights. He said the judges, not only, no, the judges took into better consideration some arguments also because of the many reactions they had seen. And part of these reactions were the reactions of 22 European governments, but not only that. And the governments, of course, don't have a right to interfere with courts because it would be a lack of democracy, but they can say what they think. And he said that thousands of letters had been sent to the court, some embarrassing to Christians, but many with an interesting content, and that the judges realized the problems at stake, and that people sent them first pages of newspapers from Latin America, and said, see, what you said has an impact on other parts of the world. And they thought, well, perhaps we should think about it. And so the Nuncio to the Council of Europe told us, you must write. What you say has an impact. People should realize that people are disturbed and in a, in a democracy that actually plays a role. And do not let only the others write and complain. Because it is, after all, interesting that one Finnish woman in Italy could have, at least in the first step, a judgment by a European court obliging Italy to change its laws because of one person. But we can also do something, after all. And it is actually, it is what happened. So, another example. Recently, it is a pending course in the European Court of Human Rights. There is a case about the, um, a trade union for priests in Romania, Orthodox priests, and lay people working for the Orthodox Church. They are 31 priests and four lay people. They uh, wanted to found a trade union in Romania against, of course, the weight uh, of the bishops, but the Orthodox bishops. And this is a pending case in the European Court of Human Rights, and people write again about it. For instance, some uh, non-governmental organizations say, well, the should the court change the tradition of a country? Does the court know what the church is? Does the court actually know that the church, as understood by the Orthodox, and for that matter by the Catholics, is a sacred institution and should be respected as such by the state as it is in Romania? 
Why should uh, an international court interfere with the tradition of a country in its understanding of the relationships between church and the state? And I don't claim that the Romanian understanding is perfect in all regards. But the question, how do you know what a church is, certainly matters. Because if a court has to judge about something, it would be good to understand what it is about. And in our understanding, the church is not only a legal institution, a state institution, there is something deeper to that. I could add that even in my diocese, it is a question now, and I give an example, now that it just crosses my mind. You probably don't know that Switzerland is composed of 23 cantons. Cantons are like the states here, uh, but even more so, if I may say. Each canton has its own constitution, its own government, its own parliament, but also its own culture. And some, it is something in Europe that perhaps sometimes people don't notice. When people coming from the other side of the Atlantic ask me about Europe, there are four cantons in my diocese where I have four different cultures. <laughs> and we really know that we are different. And of course it is in, even more so the case in Europe at large. So if people tell me how is it going in your diocese with the state, I say it depends. There are four different legal systems and four different cultures. So in one of the cantons, namely the canton of Fribourg, now the Catholic Church has a legal status. And some people want to leave the church in for the sake of not paying taxes, because they have to pay taxes in that canton. It's the only one in the four, of the four in my diocese. If they want not to pay church taxes, they have to leave the church. But the problem is that legally, legally, to be a member of the Catholic Church means to be a member of the public institution that receives taxes. So now, if people want not to pay taxes anymore, do they still have a right to receive sacraments? If somebody dies, namely, you lose, your mother dies, you go to the priest, our mother died, we would like to organize her funeral. Nope, she left the church. You see the practical problem. But I spoke about it last Saturday with a member of the government of the canton who is in charge of that. And I said, you see, part of the difficulty is that the state law says <clears throat> the church is also something that belongs to faith. So how are we going to put it together? And honestly, we don't know. It is not so much a question of religious freedom, but in a sense it is, to say that it is a little bit complex. For centuries it has been obvious. If you are a Catholic, you are part of a civil organization that means more or less the same, and you pay church taxes. It's less obvious nowadays. What do we do? And people go against us to the tribunals because of that by the way. So it just crossed my mind. <clears throat> I should conclude in order to let you time to ask questions. Well, the European situation, like the American one, of course, is shaped by a history of links between church and state. Simply that history is related to the American one, but is not the same. And after uh, the wars of religion, as I said at the beginning, the idea was you are a citizen of this country or a subject of this monarch, and then you have this religion. <clears throat> it remains in a sense, because in the mind of many, if you are Maltese or Bavarian or Italian, you must be Catholic. If you are Swedish or Norwegian, you must be Lutheran. <clears throat> if you are English, you should rather be Anglican if you can. Well, I say that because nowadays there are more Protestant Catholics than practicing Anglicans in England. So that's why I said, if you can. Well, that after this history of relative lack of religious freedom in Europe, Vatican II's declaration is a hugely important milestone. <clears throat> and that was not perceived in the States as in Europe and vice versa. I think that these texts contribute very significantly to the credibility of a church 
and of its insertion into a democratic society. But nevertheless, Christianity is still perceived as an enemy of the open society. Such a negative attitude does not apply only to Christianity, but there are signs of a specific rejection of Christianity. Why? The main cultural tendency in Europe is to reduce faith to a private factor, not only in Europe for that, it is, I think, quite global. At least, it is the same in Europe and the United States. Perhaps not exactly the same, but more or less. Faith, religion should be private. You can believe what you want, but don't disturb me. And that leads to the idea of excluding public sides of religion and the political influence of religion. Of course, above all on questions that disturb more, such as family life or things like that. And it is the case in Europe as it is the case here, and in many cases on the same questions. The situation is often noticed and leads to some, even, even to some countermeasures by the Council of Europe, the European Court, or Court of Human Rights, and other institutions. <coughs> An especially interesting sign in the arguments in favor of a public Christianity is that the neutrality of a secular attitude is sometimes denied. A secular attitude is not more neutral than a Christian one. I would even say that I think it is less neutral because it is not always obvious that people who want to defend a secular society are uh, as respectful as others, as Christians, at least, should be out of charity. We should, I think, say, with the French philosopher Jacques Maritain, who lived in the States and developed part of his thinking of that, on that in the United States during the Second World War, that if we think carefully, our idea of a democratic society of a free society has Christian origins. We admit it took time to Christians to develop some aspects of what it means to be a Christian. But would we have the idea that we are brothers or brothers and sisters, and that we are equal front of God, if not for Christianity? When Maritain said democracy has evangelical roots, that means roots in the gospel, more precisely. We can argue in favor of that. There was some democracy in Greece, but a democracy with many slaves, after all. So it was a very partial democracy. The idea any human being is <coughs> equal front of God, because God made us all, is a root for democracy. And if we lose that root, we might lose democracy at the same time. And I think that we can certainly argue in favor of that, show it, and at least warn the others I take a last example, which I find quite striking. I met years ago, when I was university chaplain in Fribourg, a student, a Chinese student, who explained to us why she had become a Catholic. She said, oh, and it was after the, de the death of Mao Zedong, who had been the dictator of China for decades. But he was still some kind of argument or pretext to, hell, to, to have a certain kind of strong government in the country, as it is nowadays, even though nobody cares about his thinking anymore. So that a Chinese woman said, I was wondering why all of us had to suffer because of one person and had to suffer so much. And I thought, oh, actually, he's a man like us, that if he warns to give to himself the role of more than a man and much more than the others, then it is dangerous also because he's not able to do it. So he has to impose it. The only solution is to have a real God, one. In front of him, all of us know what we are, simply human beings. And therefore, I thought, well, I should become a Christian. You see, it is immediately related to democracy and also to freedom. And I think that we have good reasons to argue for that. And having the Unitatis Humanae in mind, we can say we respect religious liberty because we know it is part of human nature and it is in the gospel. 
It took us time to learn from it. We made mistakes, but we insist on that. Lose our attitude, you might end up losing freedom also. So, this being said, I leave time for some questions. If you would like to raise a question if, uh, for Bishop Morrow, if you'd raise your hand, students will come around with the microphone and allow you to pose it. Thank you, Bishop. Um, I was just wondering, um, uh, with the SSPX, um, uh, what, I'm wondering why does the SSPX uh, take such issue to the Declaration on Religious Freedom, and what are the, some of the responses to their criticism? <clears throat> For the ones who might not know what it is, the Fraternity of St. Pius X is a group of priests and bishops who object to some aspects of Vatican II. And the religious freedom is probably the, their main difficulty, although there is also the liturgy. You should ask them, because <laughs> I can tell you the way I understand their attitude, but it might not be fair, although I have ideas about their attitude. What they don't say very much, but what you can write, what we can read, is that there is uh, an important French tradition, and this is really the attitude of the French in that society, but that means most of them. And the ones who give uh, the main ideas in that sense. At the time of the French Revolution, since 1789 uh, and later, there has been a tradition of rejection of the Republic by many French Catholics. It was the common view of perhaps most French Catholics until the First World War. And it remained the view of some after the, French war, uh, the First World War. Although Pope Leo XIII told the French Catholics to accept the Republic, but he was not well received in France. And part of the idea is, before the revolution, people were Catholic. Now they are not anymore. The system before was better. They had no choice. And I think that this is part of the idea, but not what they usually say. What they say is also, the idea of religious freedom is good for people who are able to judge arguments, but most people are not. So if you let all arguments be expressed in public, many people are going to lose faith. So defend the weak by preventing them from hearing errors. That is a pastoral argument that they use. And of course they have historical arguments in favor of such a view, which is mainly the teaching of Pope Pius IX, which is what they tend to identify with a tradition. And if you push a little bit, they must admit that even the over 13th after Pius IX had already uh, rather um, the same principles, certainly, that are still in Vatican II, I'd say, but another way of applying, of using them, them because as Benedict XVI said in 2005, on contingent matters, the principles are the same, but the application changes. And the idea of what church and state are also depends on what is the state in a certain period. And the modern state, which is the one that Pius IX has in view when he speaks, is a state that happened after we started slowly after the Middle Ages, and which is far less strong nowadays than it was in, in the 19th century, I'd say more or less. But we are not always conscious because they put first the question of the liturgy, that it seems to me that their main argument is religious freedom. But on that I might be wrong, and probably or not all of them agree on what the main argument is.
Uh, Bishop Morrow, thanks very much for your remarks. Uh, you talked about the uh, Catholics less than perfect historical record on religious liberty. And one challenge that creates for Catholics today is uh, our uh, commitment to religious liberty is often dismissed by critics less as a principled commitment and more a strategic concession to the fact that our moral claims are no longer majority moral claims. And so the principled commitment should not be treated as such. So how do you respond to critics while being, while being true to our historical record and acknowledging it, but uh, making the claim that this is not just about strategy, this is, this is a deeper, authentic commitment? As Vatican II says in Gaudium et Spes, not in the Identitas Humanae, we can learn from the world. We learned from our enemies or for the ones who, who are considered by themselves and by ourselves as our enemies part of what it means to be Christian. And I think about Voltaire, who was actually from next to Geneva. He said, uh, if you want to be Christians, you should be like Christ and accept to be killed rather than kill the others. On that, he was right. Not on everything, but on that. And perhaps part of his attitude against the church uh, was due to the fact that we were not Christian enough. But then, when we read Dignitatis Humanae, we find arguments that are very strong in terms of Catholic theology. Respect for human nature, and let us see what Jesus does in the Gospel. And I think that once it has been said that clearly, it will be quite difficult for Catholics to say, well, you can say what you want about human nature, and you can say what you want about Jesus in the Gospel, we are not going to do that. Because once it has been said, it's quite difficult to dismiss such arguments. Of course, all of us are sinners and we are always tempted to go back to our old sins. But nevertheless, we, had, we have a church teaching which is quite strong. Now, There's a tradition in American uh, political thought that interprets uh, principles of religious freedom in what I'd call a fairly radical or maybe increasingly radically separationist way, emphasizing the phrase separation of church and state and interpreting that in a particular way. Whereas many European countries surely have religious freedom but have a much more accommodationist than separationist uh, approach to what religious freedom means and they don't all do it the same way. I mean, I think of Germany and Poland as two countries where one can see a strong accommodation compatible with religious freedom. If you had to pick one or two European countries for us to look at for models of how accommodation can uh, be uh, practiced in the context of religious freedom, what might you point us to as countries to study? Italy. And I can argue, there is a very significant problem nowadays in Germany because people who are Catholic or Protestant are supposed to pay church taxes that are quite high. And there, the fact that if they don't pay, they don't receive sacraments are, and are not buried in the church is enforced rather much. And that doesn't help, in my view, very much the credibility of faith. And uh, in Switzerland, there is an interesting case. The canton of Vaux around Lausanne in my diocese has a new constitution that was introduced in 2003 that says the human being has a spiritual dimension. I think I'm not sure, it has been put there, I'm almost sure, it has been put there because of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And they say, if the human being has a spiritual dimension, the state must take care of that. And therefore, the state pays 
something for the life of some religious institutions, the ones who now receive something are the Reformed Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and the Jewish community. And we receive quite a lot from the government. Nevertheless, it is not perfect, in part because others, such as Muslims or Orthodox, object to that and say, why don't we receive? In that sense, Italy is much better. I think they have a best system because the system they have now, it's something like 15 years old, something like, perhaps a little bit more, perhaps mm, 18 years old, but uh, nevertheless, something like that. That says everybody has a duty to pay some contribution to the common good, and the common good can be religious or secular, so everybody has to pay, to pay the same proportion on the taxes. Um, for something that helps the common good. And you have a list. You can pay to the Catholic Church, to the World Ancient Church, to the, the Orthodox Muslims, uh, uh, Red Cross, or I don't know, but things like that. You choose, but you pay something. I think it is a very good system, because there is a reason to say that we are not a society that accepts selfishness as something good. So we take into consideration the needs of others in proportion to what we have. And as a result, after that has been introduced, because the previous system, what the state gave money to the Catholic Church, as a compensation for the goods taken away from the Catholic Church in the 19th century. So every year they had to discuss about the value related to that specific good taken away in the past, and there was every year an argument, uh, we can't ask us to pay more because we have other things to pay for. And uh, when this new system was introduced, to everybody's amazement, the Catholic Church received much more than before. And, but simply people give to, but not to anybody because they don't have opportunity to give to organizations that are considered dangerous, but we have an ample choice. I think it is a very good system. Thank you, Your Excellency. I'm wondering if you can touch a bit more on how one would address those who would contest that religious freedom inevitably leads to indifferentism, and that in being indifferent, in religious indifferentism, we come to seeing Christ's sovereignty mediated through the church somehow on the margins of the political life of a nation. So I'm wondering if you can just touch on how we hold both intention, an awareness of truth resting in one place and yet pragmatically um, working with pluralism that is um, very much here to stay. It is difficult to know, and I'm not the only one to say that. I read a text with, handwritten by Pope Paul VI saying, religious freedom, where is it going to lead us? but we need it. It's quite a mysterious text. And certainly via the idea, let us oblige everybody to be something, can give the impression that you avoid that, but we know, and I take an example, a river theological one. Before Vatican II, all theologians had to teach according to the thinking of St. Thomas Aquinas thinking which I actually like. <laughs> but still, as soon as it, was, as it was not compulsory, all of a sudden people started saying different things. Not everybody, but most, actually. And so one could think that, and that there was a problem, even from the point of view of St. Thomas Aquinas, that would insist on the fact that, at least in the philosophy, authority is the weakest argument. And so, in theory, it might have given the impression of working, but in fact, it was not that efficient. And if I see two different regions of my diocese, Fribourg and Geneva, when I say different cultures, in the canton of Fribourg, traditionally Catholic canton, where until 
the late 60s or early 70s, public school was officially Catholic. And no teacher could be hired in an elementary school without the approval of a parish priest. In that canton, still nowadays, almost all teenagers go to confirmation. Almost all. Not all, but of course, some are Protestant and they go to their Protestant confirmation. But almost all. And I meet them, at least some of them, and I see that well, confirmation, well, yes, well, we are even in favor. It doesn't seem to be a very deep conviction in many cases. It seems to be a, actually quite a high level of indifferentism. But why not that? It is what we do here. When I go to Geneva, Catholics have been traditionally a minority, although we are not a minority anymore in a sense. We are much more than reformed nowadays. But it is still a, a Protestant and above all secular society. There are less people who go to confirmation. And they have, to say the least, freedom to be something else than Catholic. But there you see them, and not only in a few cases, say, well, you know, my friends tell me I should not do that. They say it is ridiculous to be Catholic. But I reply to them, and they ask me questions, and I fight because I want to tell them what I believe. And I, what would you reply to these, they, they tell me, for instance. There is much more freedom, but as a matter of fact, they seem to be rather more convinced. So certainly, to open to many different ideas is somehow dangerous, but it seems to me that it is what even Jesus gave to people who were around him. Most people left him, as a matter of fact. What worries me is that I see that in a place like Geneva, most teenagers who go to the Confirmation are rather intellectual. And I heard the same from French people. Because if you want to have your own view against a common idea in society, you must be able to think about it. You must be accustomed to deal with arguments, to say, why do they say that? Is that a real argument or not? And for that, I understand part of the argument of some theologians of the Fraternities and Pius X who say, what do you do with weak people? We are going to lose them. And there is a problem there. We must do our best to help.